So it seems like once you confront people with the fact that there's no evidence that Woody molested Dylan, what they do then is turn the conversation to say that, well, they think his marriage to Suni is disgusting, so if he did one, it's likely that he probably did the other. First, I find it really disturbing that people conflate the two things, because that means that they're saying that they think marrying a woman in her 20s is in some way comparable to molesting a seven-year-old. And if you have to explain to somebody the difference between those two things, the conversation has already gone off the deep end. But that's how muddy people's thinking is on this. They're not going off specific information, but rather vague hunches about what kind of a person they think Woody Allen is. You'll find in these same people who are willing to broadly generalize when deciding whether somebody's a child molester, that once you try to talk to them about the Sunni situation in detail, they don't actually know anything about that either. First, they'll say that Woody married his daughter. When you point out that Sunni wasn't his daughter, they'll switch to adopted daughter, and then they'll try out stepdaughter for a test drive. Once you've established that she was none of those things, they'll switch to saying that Woody was still a father figure to her anyway. When you ask how they came to that conclusion, they'll say that he was married to Mia or that they lived together. So just really quickly to get you out of the way, as Suni has explained herself many times, she was not Woody's daughter. Andre Previn, Mia's second husband, was her father. When Suni was younger, she hardly spoke to Woody. She said that she disliked him because she disliked Mia, and she thought that he must be a sap for dating her mother who she thought was obviously using him. Actually, the fact that Woody hardly spoke to any of Mia's children that she had with Previn was one of the reasons Mia had wanted Woody to speak to Dylan's therapist in those sessions that the Pharaohs try to misrepresent as Woody being in therapy for a creepy behavior towards Dylan. The problem Mia saw was that Woody only paid attention to Moses, Satchel, and Dylan, and was an interest in the children she had with Andre. Woody took on a parental role with the children that Mia had adopted as a single parent because they didn't have a father, and he hardly talked to the others, Suni included. So calling him some kind of father figure to her is pure fantasy. Nevertheless, you could see why Mia would be upset that he started dating her daughter, and how it would obviously create an awkward situation. And that's something that Woody has freely admitted to. But again, I can't believe that I have to say that an unconventional relationship with a 21-year-old that has led to a long marriage is not the same as sexually assaulting a 7-year-old in an attic. What I'm getting at here is there has been an attempt to link my relationship with Sunni with charges of child molestation. They're two completely different things. I have an adult relationship with Sunni. Those people that feel they want to feel that it's, it's questionable or not their taste or, they, or she's too young for me or she's Mia's daughter or whatever they want to think, I'll take that heat. I, I'm responsible for that. I accept all the criticism that they want. You know, that it, it, it's my life and it's Sunni's life and I, I accept that. That does not mean that I should be charged with child molestation. Suni has told her own version of the story and strenuously objects to being seen as a victim. And it's interesting that Ronan, who is seen as the champion of Me Too, fought against the story being published and was successful in having it partially censored. When they talk about believing women, it seems that they're only referring to the ones who have stories that are convenient for them. Woody started seeing Suni in December of 1991 at the suggestion of Mia that he should take Suni to basketball games to spend more time with her since, like I said, before that Woody and Suni hardly spoke. Mia was hoping that spending time at the games together might bring them a little closer, and it turned out that it worked a little better than she had hoped. At the time, Suni was either 19 or 21, depending on which estimate you use. Her birth was not recorded in Korea, but based on bone samples, they placed it in that range. In public records, the date the pharaoh settled on was October 8, 1970, and in her 1982 Vanity Fair interview, Mia said that Suni was about seven when adopted, which would still stick to the 1970 date. However, by the time of her memoir in 1997, Mia was saying that Suni was five when adopted, which of course would push down the age she was when she started her affair with Woody. Even with her revised estimate, Suni would still be 19 teen and illegal adult when she started dating Woody, but now Mia could say she was a teen when Woody started to sleep with her. When you tell people that she was well over legal age when her relationship with Woody began, they'll then switch gears again and say that he must have been grooming her before that. In this case, I'm not even sure what people mean by the word grooming, and I don't think that they really know either. If you have a fetish for underage girls, grooming them and waiting until they're 21 before having any kind of sexual contact with them kind of seems to defeat the purpose, but nonetheless, grooming is one of those buzzwords that people like to throw into a conversation when they can't articulate anything meaningful. Talking about about this a while ago on Twitter, I had somebody just tweet the word grooming at me, a, a one-word tweet, as though that word alone was checkmate in the conversation. Their involuntary duosyllabic brain spasm, of course, got more likes than my reply, which had information in it. I've said before that if you're really curious about whether Woody's guilty, you could always just read the tweets of the people who think he's guilty, and you'll see that they don't have two brain cells to rub together between them. Read some of the tweets of the he married his daughter crowd, and you can usually tell it won't be productive to argue with them because they have the spelling and punctuation and grasp of critical thinking of a person who's 
profoundly mentally disabled. You know, because if you think Denny and Tommy are slow, your cousin May is dumb like a, you know, like a horse or a dog or something. Yeah, but you know, don't worry, I'm sure nothing could go wrong with letting a dirt stupid mob supplant our legal system and decide if somebody is innocent or guilty, right? The idea of Sunni supposedly being groomed is a way to reduce the statements of an adult woman on the subject to those of a child so you can remove her ability to make up her own mind and ignore what she has to say about it. In fact, she's always been articulate about it and independent. NBC's Morgan Radford gets us up to speed. Watch. Overnight, Sunyi Previn breaking her silence 25 years after her affair with Woody Allen first made headlines. Previn, now 47 and married to Allen for more than 20 years, now speaking out about her famous mother, telling New York Magazine's website Vulture they were like oil and water from the very beginning of their relationship. Mia wasn't maternal to me from the get-go, says Previn, who was adopted by Pharaoh and her then-husband, the pianist and conductor Andre Previn. She tried to teach me the alphabet with those wooden blocks. If I didn't get them right, sometimes she'd throw them at me or down on the floor. Who can learn under that pressure? The profile that Sunni was interviewed for in 2018 created a furor and was billed as her telling her side of the story. And she did greatly expand on what she said before and provided new details of abuse and drama in Mia's household that echoed Moses' version of events. But she'd actually already given a statement on her relationship with Woody and, unlike Dylan Farrow's story, between 1992 and 2018, Sunni's story remained remarkably consistent. In 1992, she told Newsweek, Please don't try to dramatize my relationship with Woody Allen. He was never any kind of father figure to me. I never had any dealings with him. He rarely came to our apartment before his own children were born. Even then he never spoke, and the truth is I never cared that much for him. He was always preoccupied with work and never talked to me. Not really to any of us. Only when Dylan was born did he start visiting regularly and then only to play with the baby. My own father is Andre Previn, who came to visit pretty often and took us all out frequently. When I first got friendly with Woody, he and Mia were finished with the romance and were just friends. I think Mia would have been just as angry if he had taken up with another actress or his secretary. Mia was always very hot-tempered and given to rages which terrified all the kids. They can't speak freely because they're still dependent on her, but they could really tell stories and I'm sure one day they will. It's true Mia was violent with me and I have conclusive proof. Now she told people back in 1992 that Mia had hit her and slapped her and people didn't seem interested in hearing about it. In her 2018 profile she went into greater detail again, describing Mia throwing things at her from a young age, slapping and spanking her, screaming at her and calling her retarded, threatening to send her to an insane asylum. Again, like in Moses' blog, Sunni has a long and detailed account describing many instances of abuse, but people seem happy to ignore it while they also consider it heresy to question Dylan's much, much thinner story. Back in 1992, when the Pharaoh camp was trying to paint Woody as a predator, they supported Sunni's assertion that Mia dismissed her and treated her like she was stupid by insisting that she was dim-witted to the point that she couldn't possibly have written her statement to Newsweek. They insisted Woody must have written it for her, saying that she didn't even know the words that the statement used, in spite of the vocabulary in the statement being quite simple. In fact, Sunni was usually on the dean's list at Drew and now has a master's degree in special education from Columbia University. She worked as a teacher at Spence, an exclusive private school in Manhattan as well. At the time, the pharaohs were still working to present themselves as a loving home from which Sunni had been stolen by an evil pervert, and Mia claimed that they loved Sunni and would welcome her back with open arms, in between giving interviews where she would then try to make the successful college student out to be submental. But Mia's story about it began to shift, and by her 1997 book tour, she was describing Sunni as connected and almost a sociopath, and talking about her more as a rival lover who had stolen her man, jealous exactly as Sunni said in her 1992 statement that Mia would be of anybody who had taken her man away, as opposed to a mother concerned for an abused daughter. In 2006, Mia said, quote, She was on the streets in Korea when she was captured and brought to the state orphanage, and in a way I can see it from her perspective, a very limited perspective, that she's improved her situation. She's got the penthouse and the seat at Elaine's, or whatever I had she has. If she really was angry because she felt that Sunni was being taken advantage of by a pervert, it seems odd that what she focuses on is jealousy of how Sunni now has the nicer penthouse that used to be hers. She still talks about Sunni almost as an animal when she mentions her very limited perspective. In 1997, she claimed that Sunni was unable to bond with people and would scratch and bite at them, although Sunni has had no problem bonding with Woody and has now raised two healthy and happy daughters of her own who both defend her and Woody. Once when Mia described looking at the nude Polaroids that Woody had taken of Sunni, she said, quote, I felt I was looking straight into the face of pure evil. 
people, and it's Suni's face she was describing looking at. Mia claims that Suni's problems were from her upbringing in Korea where she lived with a prostitute mother who would beat her. Suni even says that at one point Mia tried to film her and get her to talk about this abusive prostitute mother, much like how she would later film Dylan describing being abused. The trouble is that Suni insists that she has no idea where this prostitute mother story came from, as she doesn't remember any such thing. She was found homeless on the streets, and her mother has never been identified, so Suni would be the only source that could have any information about her, and she never told anybody any of this stuff about an abusive prostitute. Mia was again embellishing the life stories of her children to suit her own creative whims, like when she tried to rename Suni Gigi in spite of Suni having a name and no need for a new one. In her Mia Farrow profiles, Maureen Orth repeats the prostitute mother stories, complete with vivid details about her banging Suni's head in a door and abusing her in other ways. Suni never told anybody any of that. Orth's piece adds the detail that when Suni was found, she had no language at all and spoke in gibberish, when in actual fact Suni ended up at an orphanage when she spoke to a woman who was trying to help her and called the police. Also, if Suni spoke only gibberish, then how could she have told people these harrowing stories about the prostitute mother that Mia relays? Maybe when Mia says gibberish, she means Korean, because Suni says she never made any effort to communicate to her in her own language after she was adopted, instead expecting her to immediately learn English and becoming angry and throwing things at her when she didn't learn fast enough. You can see the connection I'm trying to make by pointing out yet another example of Mia developing a fictional story about the lives of one of her children, and Maureen Orth being more than happy to write that story for Vanity Fair to publish in spite of the story falling apart under the mildest dusting of common sense. But the idea of presenting Suni as some kind of femme fatale that stole Woody away from Mia is even more ridiculous than the idea that Woody married his daughter, because at that time Woody and Mia didn't have anything resembling a healthy relationship for Suni to break up. For one thing, Mia Farrow has said that Ronan Farrow is possibly Frank Sinatra's son, so unless she was just joking, she was still sleeping with Sinatra at the time anyway. Whether or not that's true, she said herself that her and Frank never really broke up. But aside from that, Woody has said that for the last period of the relationship after Ronan was born, they had grown apart to the point that she'd even taken back his key to their apartment. He already never lived there, and never even spent the night there, and didn't see her for most of the months out of the year when she was at her country home in Connecticut. You don't have to take Woody's word for it that the relationship was virtually over either. Satchel's therapist, Dr. Coates, the one who saw Woody and Mia both often during the course of therapy and, and testified about Mia's deranged attitude after the discovery of the affair, said that even before that they bickered about everything, and that, quote, the amount of non-agreement between them was so great that it led me to ask why they were still together. From her first meeting with the couple in 1990, around two years before Woody's affair with Suni began, Coates says she thought their relationship was in considerable trouble. Any description of the relationship between Woody and Mia at the time makes it abundantly clear that he was only coming around to see Moses and Dylan and sometimes Ronan when Mia wasn't locked up in a room alone with him. Moses and Suni both describe it the same way, that his relationship with Mia was over. He's explained that the entire reason he felt like he should legally adopt Moses and Dylan wasn't because he and Mia were raising them together, but rather because he felt that his relationship to Mia was over, but he still wanted to be a father to Moses and Dylan, and without adopting them, he would have no legal claim. When Suni participated in her 2018 profile, Ronan of course went into full-blown attack mode, getting the magazine to soften the piece by changing certain details, such as Mia beating Suni with the telephone, and making the magazine say that they were careful to make sure they also presented the perspective of Ronan and Dylan, even though, of course, the entire premise of the piece was to show Suni's perspective, as Suni's side of the story has had vastly less exposure over the years than Ronan and Dylan's, but Ronan and Dylan seem to be unaware that not every story printed in the world is about them. Sort of amusingly, Ronan complained that the piece was biased because the author was a friend of Woody's, and then Ronan's boyfriend John Lovett used his podcast to trash the story. I suppose somehow Ronan's boyfriend is a less biased source than Woody's infrequent social acquaintance? The shamelessness of the hypocrisy here is kind of astonishing, but we'll see that it gets much worse as things go on. Contrary to trying to use this relationship to get the piece written, Woody actually asked the piece's author, Daphne Merkin, not to publish it on more than one occasion because he didn't want to be involved in the drama. Woody Allen has always denied it and has denied it powerfully. Mm -hmm. has, has always denied it, has uh, gone very directly after any woman proximate to it. Huge, huge public relations apparatus designed to do that. Ronan's boyfriend John Lovett was a speechwriter to President Obama, among other high-profile political work. They're trying to cast Woody as the powerful one with the vast media apparatus to disseminate his side, while Lovett was able to put words into the mouth of the President of the United States. This is uh, where I work. I bought this when I was 16. Still works like a tank. And I've typed everything uh, that I've ever I've written, every script every New Yorker piece, everything I've ever done on this typewriter. If I'm typing something, I have my scissors here, and I have a lot of these things, these little stapling machines. But when I come to a nice part, then I cut that part off, 
and staple it on to something else with this. While the pharaohs were doing everything they could to vilify Merkin and making ridiculous statements about Woody using his supposed vast media empire to manipulate the world, the only interview that Woody did at the time was actually for a small Argentinian Spanish language TV station. Of course not. I mean, this is just so crazy. This is something that has been thoroughly looked at 25 years ago by all the authorities and everybody came to the conclusion that it was untrue. And that was the end and I've gone on with my life and now for it to come back now, I mean, my God, it's, it's a terrible thing to accuse a person of, uh, you know. I mean, I'm a man with a family and my own children and, um, you know, so of course it's upsetting. The interview was in such an obscure outlet that it took websites several days to notice that it even existed, in spite of the Me Too media fear over the story at the time. Because that's how you do it when you're a master of the media with a vast, powerful network of influence over everything, right? On a small TV station, people who speak English will never even see.